hospitality, your leadership, and your tireless efforts in the preparation of this COP. Your Royal Highnesses, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, the six years since the Paris Climate Agreement have been the six hottest years on record. Our addiction to fossil fuels is pushing humanity to the brink. We face a stark choice. Either we stop it or it stops us. And it's time to say enough. Enough of brutalizing biodiversity. Enough of killing ourselves with carbon. Enough of treating nature like a toilet. Enough of burning and drilling and mining our way deeper. We are digging our own graves. Our planet is changing before our eyes, from the ocean depths to mountain tops, from melting glaciers to relentless extreme weather events. Sea level rise is double the rate it was 30 years ago. Oceans are hotter than ever and getting warmer faster. Parts of the Amazon rainforest now emit more carbon than they absorb. Recent climate action announcements might give the impression that we are on track to turn things around. This is an illusion. The last published report on national determined contributions showed that they would still condemn the world to a calamitous 2.7 degree increase. And even if the recent pledges were clear and credible, and there are serious questions about some of them, we are still careening towards climate catastrophe. Even in the best case scenario, temperatures will rise well above two degrees. So as we open this much anticipated climate conference, we are still heading for climate disaster. Young people know it. Every country sees it. Small island developing states and other vulnerable ones live it. And for them, failure is not an option. Failure is a death sentence. Excellencies, we face a moment of truth. We are fast approaching tipping points that will trigger escalating feedback loops of global heating. But investing in the net zero climate resilient economy will create feedback loops of its own, virtuous circles of sustainable growth, jobs, and opportunity. We have progress to build upon. A number of countries have made credible commitments to net zero emissions by mid-century. Many have pulled the plug on international financing of coal. Over 700 cities are leading the way to carbon neutrality, and the private sector is waking up. The Net Zero Asset Owners Alliance, the gold standard for credible commitments and transparent targets, is managing 10 trillion US dollars in assets and catalyzing change across industries. The Climate Action Army, led by young people, is unstoppable. They are larger, they are louder, and they assure you they are not going away, and I stand with them. Excellencies, the science is clear. We know what to do. First, we must keep the goal of 1.5 degrees Celsius alive. This requires greater ambition on mitigation and the immediate concrete action to reduce global emissions by 45% by 2030. G20 countries have a particular responsibility as they represent around 80% of emissions. According to the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities, in light of national circumstances, developed countries must lead the effort. But the emerging economies too must go the extra mile as their contribution is essential for the effective reduction of emissions. We need maximum ambition from all countries on all fronts to make Glasgow a success. I urge developed countries and the emerging economies 
to build coalitions to create the financial and technological conditions to accelerate the carbonization of the economy as well as the phase out of coal. These coalitions are meant to support the large emitters that face more difficulties in the transition from grey to green for them to be able to do it. Let's have no illusions. If commitments fall short by the end of this COP, countries must revisit their national climate plans and policies, not every five years, every year, every moment, until keeping to 1.5 degrees is assured, until subsidies to fossil fuels end, until there is a price on carbon, until coal is phased out. But we also need greater clarity. There is a deficit of credibility and a surplus of confusion over emissions reductions and net zero targets with different meanings and different metrics. That is why, beyond the mechanisms already established in the Paris Agreement, I'm announcing today that it will establish a group of experts to propose clear standards to measure and analyze net zero commitments from non-state actors. Second, we must do more to protect vulnerable communities from the clear and present dangers of climate change. Over the last decade, nearly 4 billion people suffered climate-related disasters. That devastation will only grow. But adaptation works. Early warning systems save lives. Climate smart agriculture and infrastructure save jobs. And all donors must allocate half their climate finance to adaptation. And public and multilateral development banks should start as soon as possible. Third, this COP must be a moment of solidarity. The 100 billion US dollars a year climate finance commitment in support of developing countries must become a 100 billion climate finance reality. And this is critical to restoring trust and credibility. I welcome the efforts led by Canada and Germany to help us get there. It is an important first step, but it delays the largest support for years and it doesn't give clear guarantees. And beyond 100 billion, developing countries need far greater resources to fight COVID-19, to build resilience and pursue sustainable development. Those suffering the most, namely least developed countries and small island developing states need urgent funding, more public climate finance, more overseas development aid, more grants, easier access to funding. And multilateral development banks must work much more seriously at mobilizing greater investment through blended and private finance. Excellencies, the sirens are sounding. Our planet is talking to us and telling us something. And so are people everywhere. Climate action tops the list of people's concerns across countries, age and gender. We must listen, and we must act, and we must choose wisely. On behalf of these and future generations, I urge you, choose ambition, choose solidarity, choose to safeguard our future and save humanity, and I thank you. There will now be a short film a message from our planet to all of us, Earth to COP. Commuter chaos this morning and delays for the day as high levels of water brought services to a standstill. The Met Office says we should be braced for more of this. Forget summer, they say it's going...
Прошло более 70 лет, но все еще загрязненность воздуха остается основной. to try a lot more jobs created in the green economy change. Climate change is the expression of the renewable energy technologies to fundamentally transform the energy system are at our disposal. So how do we begin the process of reversing global warming? We need innovation and this kind of innovation Launched the largest tree plantation campaign. It's not cheaper to build off your wind farm to develop a climate altering. By continually reinvesting in our grassland, we are locking down. This is a critical moment that we cannot not be part of. Twenty-six is one of the most important diplomatic gatherings in history. We've got a long way to go. But there is momentum. Roll up your sleeves and do it. Your Royal Highnesses, Your Excellencies, Lords, Ladies and Gentlemen, please welcome His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, the COVID-19 pandemic has shown us just how devastating a global cross-border threat can be. Climate change and biodiversity loss are no different. In fact, they pose an even greater existential threat to the extent that we have to put ourselves on what might be called a warlike footing. Having myself had the opportunity of consulting many of you over these past 18 months, I know you all carry a heavy burden on your shoulders, and you do not need me to tell you that the eyes and hopes of the world are upon you. To act with all dispatch and decisively, because time has quite literally run out. The recent IPCC report gave us a clear diagnosis of the scale of the problem. We know what we must do. With a growing global population, 
creating ever-increasing demand on the planet's finite resources, we have to reduce emissions urgently and take action to tackle the carbon already in the atmosphere, including from coal-fired power stations. Putting a value on carbon, thus making carbon capture solutions more economical, is therefore absolutely critical. Similarly, after billions of years of evolution, nature is our best teacher. In this regard, restoring natural capital, accelerating nature-based solutions, and leveraging the circular bioeconomy will be vital to our efforts. As we tackle this crisis, our efforts cannot be a series of independent initiatives running in parallel. The scale and scope of the threat we face call for a global systems level solution based on radically transforming our current fossil fuel based economy to one that is genuinely renewable and sustainable. So, ladies and gentlemen, my plea today is for countries to come together to create the environment that enables every sector of industry to take the action required. We know this will take trillions, not billions of dollars. We also know that countries, many of whom are burdened by growing levels of debt, simply cannot afford to go green. Here we need a vast military-style campaign to marshal the strength of the global private sector. With trillions at its disposal, far beyond global GDP, and with the greatest respect, beyond even the governments of the world's leaders, it offers the only real prospect of achieving fundamental economic transition. So, how do we do it? First, how do we get the private sector all pulling in the same direction? After nearly two years now of consultation, CEOs have told me that we need to bring together global industries to map out, in very practical terms, what it will take to make the transition. We know from the pandemic that the private sector can speed up timelines dramatically when everyone agrees on the urgency and the direction. So each sector needs a clear strategy to speed up the process of getting innovations to market. Second, who pays and how? We need to align private investment behind, those, behind these industry strategies to help finance the transition efforts, which means building the confidence of investors so that the financial risk is reduced. Crucially, investment is needed to help transition from coal to clean energy. If we can develop a pipeline of many more sustainable and bankable projects at a sufficient scale, it will attract greater investment. Third, which switches do we flick to enable these objectives? More than 300 of the world's leading CEOs and institutional investors have told me that alongside the promises countries have made, their nationally determined contributions, they need clear market signals agreed globally so that they have the confidence to invest without the goalposts suddenly moving. This is the framework I've offered in the Terra Carta Roadmap created by my Sustainable Markets Initiative with nearly 100 specific actions for acceleration. Together, we are working to drive trillions of dollars in support of transition across 10 of the most emitting and polluting industries. They include energy, agriculture, transportation, health systems, and fashion. The reality of today's global supply chains means that industry transition will affect every country and every producer in the world. There is absolutely no doubt in my mind that the private sector is ready to play its part and to work with governments to find a way forward. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, 
Many of your countries, I know, are already feeling the devastating impact of climate change through ever-increasing droughts, mudslides, floods, hurricanes, cyclones and wildfires, as we've just seen on that terrifying film. Any leader who has had to confront such life-threatening challenges knows that the cost of inaction is far greater than the cost of prevention. So I can only urge you, as the world's decision makers, to find practical ways of overcoming differences so we can all get down to work together to rescue this precious planet and save the threatened future of our young people. Thank you, Mr. Please welcome the COP26 People's Advocate, who has dedicated his lifetime to highlighting the beauty of the natural world, Sir David Attenborough. Excellencies, delegates, ladies and gentlemen, as you spend the next two weeks debating, negotiating, persuading and compromising, as you surely must, it's easy to forget that ultimately the emergency climate comes down to a single number. The concentration of carbon in our atmosphere the measure that greatly determines global temperature. And the changes in that one number is the clearest way to chart our own story, for it defines our relationship with our world. For much of humanity's ancient history, that number bounced wildly between 180 and 300. And so too did global temperatures. It was a brutal and unpredictable world. At times, our ancestors existed only in tiny numbers. But just over 10,000 years ago, that number suddenly stabilized. And with it, Earth's climate. We found ourselves in an unusually benign period with predictable seasons and reliable weather. For the first time, civilization was possible and we wasted no time in taking advantage of that. Everything we've achieved in the last 10,000 years was enabled by the stability during this time. The global temperature has not wavered over this period by more than plus or minus one degree Celsius. Until now. One burning of fossil, our burning of fossil fuels, our destruction of nature, our approach to industry construction and learning, our releasing carbon into the atmosphere at an unprecedented pace and scale. We are already in trouble. The stability we all depend on is breaking. This story is one of inequality as well as instability. Today, those who've done the least to cause this problem are being the hardest hit. Ultimately, all of us will feel the impact, some of which are now unavoidable. My world is melting. You think you have control, we actually have no control. I'm absolutely terrified to bring a child to this world. Is this how our story is due to end? A tale of the smartest species doomed 
by that all too human characteristic of failing to see the bigger picture in pursuit of short-term goals. Perhaps the fact that the people most affected by climate change are no longer some imagined future generation, but young people alive today, perhaps that will give us the impetus we need to rewrite our story, to turn this tragedy into a triumph. We are, after all, the greatest problem solvers to have ever existed on Earth. We now understand this problem. We know how to stop the number rising and put it in reverse. We must have carbon emissions halt them this decade. We must recapture billions of tons of carbon from the air. We must fix our sights on keeping one and a half degrees within reach. A new industrial revolution powered by millions of sustainable innovations is essential and is indeed already beginning. We will all share in the benefits. Affordable clean energy, healthy air, and enough food to sustain us all. Nature is a key ally. Wherever we restore the wild, it will recapture carbon and help us bring back balance to our planet. And as we work to build a better world, we must acknowledge no nation has completed its development because no advanced nation is yet sustainable. All have a journey still to compete so that all nations have a good standard of living and a modest footprint. We're going to have to learn together how to achieve this, ensuring none are left behind. We must use this opportunity to create a more equal world. And our motivation should not be fear, but hope. Can we fix climate problem in one generation? My answer would be yes, we have to. We need to not just to talk about what we can do, but to do what we can. This is a challenge that we should try to solve in a quick way with the long-term vision. It comes down to this. The people alive now are the generation to come. will look at this conference and consider one thing. Did that number stop rising? and start to drop as a result of commitments made here. There's every reason to believe that the answer can be yes. If working apart, we are force powerful enough to destabilize our planet, surely working together, we are powerful enough to save it. In my lifetime, I've witnessed a terrible decline in yours, you could and should witness a wonderful recovery. That desperate hope, ladies and gentlemen, delicate, excellency, is why the world is looking to you and why you are here. Thank you. Please welcome the Prime Minister of Barbados, Mia Motley. Your Royal Highness, Excellencies, Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, the pandemic has taught us that national solutions to global problems do not work. We come to Glasgow with global ambition to save our people and to save our planet, but we now find three gaps on mitigation, 
climate pledges or NDCs. Without more, we will leave the world on a pathway to 2.7 degrees, and with more, we are still likely to get to two degrees. These commitments made by some are based on technologies yet to be developed, and this is at best reckless and at worst dangerous. On finance, we are $20 billion short of the 100 billion, and this commitment, even then, might only be met in 2023. On adaptation, adaptation finance remains only at 25%, not the 50-50 split that was promised nor needed given the warming that is already taking place on this earth. Climate finance to frontline small island developing states declined by 25% in 2019. Failure to provide the critical finance and that of loss and damage is measured, my friends, in lives and livelihoods in our communities. This is immoral and it is unjust. If Glasgow is to deliver on the promises of Paris, it must close these three gaps. So I ask to you, what must we say to our people living on the front line in the Caribbean, in Africa, in Latin America, in the Pacific, when both ambition and regrettably some of the needed faces at Glasgow are not present? What excuse should we give for the failure? In the words of that Caribbean icon, Eddie Grant, will they mourn us on the front line? When will we, as world leaders across the world, address the pressing issues that are truly causing our people angst and worry, whether it is climate or whether it is vaccines? Simply put, when will leaders lead? Our people are watching and our people are taking note. And are we really going to leave Scotland without the resolve and the ambition that is sorely needed to save lives and to save our planet? How many more voices and how many more pictures of people must we see on these screens without being able to move? Or are we so blinded and hardened that we can no longer appreciate the cries of humanity? I have been saying to Barbadians for many years that many hands make light work. Today, we need the correct mix of voices, ambition, and action. Do some leaders in this world believe that they can survive and thrive on their own? Have they not learned from the pandemic? Can there be peace and prosperity if one third of the world literally prospers? and the other two-thirds of the world live under siege and face calamitous threats to our well-being? What the world needs now, my friends, is that which is within the ambit of less than 200 persons who are willing and prepared to lead. Leaders must not fail those who elect them to lead. And I say to you, there is a sword that can cut down this Gordian knot and it has been wielded before. The central banks of the wealthiest countries engaged in $25 trillion of quantitative easing in the last 13 years. $25 trillion. Of that, $9 trillion was in the last 18 months to fight the pandemic. Had we used that $25 trillion to purchase bonds, to finance the energy transition, or the transition of how we eat, or how we move ourselves in transport, we would now today be reaching that 1.5 degrees limit that is so vital to us. I say to you today in Glasgow that an annual increase in the SDRs of $500 billion a year for 20 years put in a trust to finance the transition is the real gap, Secretary General, that we need to close, not the 50 billion being proposed for adaptation. And if 500 billion songs big to you, guess what? It is just 2% of the 25 trillion. This is the sword we need to wield. 
Our excitement one hour into this event is far less than it was six months ago leading up to this event. Can we, with those voices and these speeches from Sir David and others, find it within ourselves to get the resolve to bring Glasgow back on track? Or do we leave today believing that it was a failure before it starts? Our world, my friends, stands at a fork in the road, one no less significant than when the United Nations was formed in 1945. But then, the majority of our countries here did not exist. We exist now. The difference is we want to exist 100 years from now. And if our existence is to mean anything, then we must act in the interests of all of our people who are depending on us. And if we don't, we will allow the path of greed and selfishness to sow the seeds of our common destruction. The leaders of today, not 2030, not 2050, must make this choice. It is in our hands. And our people and our planet need it more than ever. We can work with who is ready to go because the train is ready to leave. And those who are not yet ready we need to continue to ring circle and to remind them that their people, not our people, but their citizens, need them to get on board as soon as possible. Code red, code red to the G7 countries. Code red, code red to the G20. Earth to cop, that's what it said. Earth to cop. For those who have eyes to see, for those who have ears to listen, and for those who have a heart to feel, 1.5 is what we need to survive. Two degrees, yes, SG, is a death sentence for the people of Antigua and Barbuda, for the people of the Maldives, for the people of Dominica and Fiji, for the people of Kenya and Mozambique, and yes, for the people of Samoa and Barbados. We do not want that dreaded death sentence. And we've come here today to say, try harder, try harder. Because our people, the climate army, the world, the planet, needs our actions now, not next year, not in the next decade. Thank you. Bringing their message from their countries to COP, we will now hear from climate campaigners in Chile and Egypt. Mi nombre es Isis Riquelme, activista climática, ecofeminista y estudiante de geografía de Chile. Thank you, Lisa. Your Royal Highnesses, ladies and gentlemen, there can surely be no more fitting location than this for the premiere of our planet. Directly behind me, behind this enormous screen, is a statue of Charles Darwin, whose astonishing understanding of the natural world led to what has been called the greatest idea in human history, the theory of evolution by natural selection. Darwin revealed that all species have evolved over time to best exploit the conditions in which they live. He further realized that these conditions are not simply those of geography and climate, but also their relationship to other lives that live alongside. From the delicate codependencies of bees and orchids to the dramatic connection between cheetah and gazelle, all life on Earth is both product and contributor to its place in space and time. 
This complex web of life of which we are a part has been millennia in the making. Whilst Darwin's insights explain how this web came about over 200 years later, we are still only beginning to understand its interconnections and which of these connections are the most vital. Yet we do know for certain is that these connections can break. From the dinosaurs to my right to other spectacular fossils on my left, we have all tonight been within touching distance of astonishing fragments of ecosystems long gone. As far as we know, there have been five major extinction events on our planet. Events caused by changes so severe that many species simply can't adapt and, as such, die out. Right now, we are in the midst of the Earth's sixth mass extinction, one every bit as profound and far-reaching as that which wiped out the dinosaurs. It's almost impossible to grasp as we go about our lives that the rest of life on Earth is experiencing destruction on the scale of that wrought by a colossal asteroid collision. But consider these facts. 96% of the mass of mammals on our planet today are us and the livestock that we've domesticated. Only 4% is everything else, from elephants to badgers, tigers to bats. 70% of all birds are now domestic domesticated poultry, mostly chickens. Nature once determined how we survive. Now we determine how nature survives. One of the things Darwin's work has taught us is that we break nature's connections at our peril. Yet, break them, we do, at ever greater speed. The impacts of our growing population and our consumption now directly threaten our own future. That magnificent creature up there whose skeletons hangs up there above us, the blue whale, can give us inspiration. Just 30 years ago, most whale species, including the blue whale, were heading towards extinction. A public outcry led to a global agreement to protect whales, and now most populations are recovering. We've subsequently learned how important whales are, to the entire ocean system, including the fish that we eat. So saving these majestic creatures actually benefits us as well. What we did to save the whales, we must now do for all nature. And that is a communications challenge as much as it is a scientific one. The eight-part Our Planet series aims to reach a billion people around the world. It celebrates the species and habitats that still remain and reveals what must be protected to ensure both people and nature thrive. I've always believed that few people will protect the natural world if they don't first love and understand it. Many sequences in the Our Planet series reveal nature at its most fascinating and delightful. Others prove that good things do indeed come to those who wait, often for a very long time, as the many talented cameramen and women who've recorded all kinds of wonders for us know only too well. But what really makes Our Planet stand out is the clear driving story that runs through the entire species, the entire series, and the wider communications project. The natural world is not just nice to have, 
It fundamentally matters to each and every one of us. This has been a true labor of love for hundreds of filmmakers, cinema photographers, conservationists, editors, musicians, production and teams, all of whom have brought their best work to this most important story that there is. A story that could not be more universal or more timely. The ability to tell that story in almost every country on earth at the same time via Netflix brings the possibility of an unprecedented global understanding of the one place that we all call home. It's now my great privilege to hand over to someone whose father perhaps influenced him to spend much of his life experiencing and deeply understanding the natural world and whose passion and curiosity for the wonders of our planet has clearly inspired his next generation. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the President of WWF UK, His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales.